when the mainstream press and the government says nobody could have predicted this, they're lying through their fucking teeth. Engineers at the crippled Fukushima Daiichi nuclear plant have identified why the number three reactor experienced a meltdown after the 2011 disaster. They say the accident likely resulted from the early breakdown of the cooling system and failed attempts to inject water. The plant's number one, two, and three reactors suffered meltdowns. At reactor number three, the meltdown began at about 10.40 a.m. on March 13th, two days after the quake and tsunami. Engineers with Tokyo Electric Power Company say the latest findings suggest that part of the fuel was exposed because the water level inside the reactor was too low. This indicates the functions of the emergency cooling system had already been lost by early morning. Their report also says firefighters began to douse the reactors with water shortly after 9 a.m. They say that may have been ineffective because of leaks from the piping. TEPCO officials say they will continue to investigate why massive amounts of radioactive substances were released and how it happened. Hi, I'm Arnie Gunderson from Fairwinds, and this is a special video. I'd like to share with you my concerns about a new law that's just been passed in Japan called the State Secrets Law. I'm concerned about the law because it's going to stifle the free flow of scientific information about Fukushima Daiichi. The law is written in such a way that it doesn't tell what a state secret is but it makes talking to a reporter illegal and punishable by jail time if the state determines that a reporter has been told a state secret. This is a scary precedent. The Japanese people are against it, the Japanese press are against it, and in fact all the minority parties in the Japanese government are against it. But the pro-nuclear Abe regime has just passed this state secrets law and ramrodded it through the Diet, which is their parliament, over the objections of all of the other parliamentarians. This is a serious change in uh, freedom of the press, which has been allowed in Japan since World War II, and is not a precedent that Fairwinds thinks helps the free flow of scientific information as it relates to Fukushima Daiichi. We've already told you that Many scientists have had their reports squashed and their careers threatened. This law will make things even worse. I'm very afraid that if I go back to Tokyo and try to speak, I'll be arrested too. Well, that leaves us and the team at Fairwinds to provide the information to the Japanese people, the information they need to know. It appears that the only vehicle to have that happen now that the Japanese have passed the state secrets law is the internet. By passing this state secrets law, the Abe regime showed its true colors. It's really only interested in protecting the corporate power brokers that provide campaign funding and is really not interested in protecting the people within the state of Japan. But what the state secret law shows is that in Japan, Japan has the people of the government, by the government, and for the government. This law is a mistake. At Fairwinds, we know it's a mistake. And we really do appreciate your contributions that are allowing us to continue to speak truth to power, not just in the past, but into 2014 as well. So thank you very much for your contributions. I'm Arnie Gunderson. I'll keep you informed. Okay, Ted, what's the problem? Hello, Betty. What's the problem? I haven't got a problem. I've got fucking problems. Plural. One away, yeah? China has closed its doors to all imports of West Coast shellfish. Chinese officials tested samples of gooey duck clams and found elevated levels of arsenic and a toxin that causes paralytic shellfish poisoning. KUOW's Ashley Ahern reports. U.S. officials believe the contaminated clams were harvested in Washington or Alaska. Right now they're waiting to hear back from Chinese officials for more details that will help them identify the exact source. But until further notice, China's not accepting any shellfish harvested from California to Alaska. Jerry Borchard is in charge of monitoring toxins in shellfish for the Washington Department of Health. He says China's actions are unusual. 
they've never done anything like that that I've ever seen since I've been here, uh, where they would not allow shellfish from this entire area based on potentially two areas or maybe it was just one area we don't really know yet. Last year, the U.S. exported more than half a billion dollars worth of shellfish, with China as its biggest customer. The shellfish industry in Washington is worth $270 million annually. Bill Dewey is with Taylor Shellfish, the largest shellfish supplier in Washington. He says China's move is having an impact. I was just talking to our Gouda manager, and he's got two harvest crews and three beach crews essentially doing make work. He, he's too nice a guy to lay him off during the holidays, but there's only so much you can be charitable about making work for people. There's no telling when China will lift its import ban, but shellfish on the market in the U.S. are safe to eat. Officials say the investigation is ongoing. A mysterious invasion at California beaches. Hundreds upon hundreds of squid. Good evening, I'm Elizabeth Cook. And I'm Ken Bastida. Now they washed up all of a sudden along a 12-mile stretch of beach. CBS 5 reporter Kit Doe on the theory about where all that squid came from and how people have been out there trying to save them. The beaches of Santa Cruz County are littered with the carcasses of thousands of Humboldt squid. They've stranded themselves from Aptos to Watsonville, a span of 12 miles. You just see them essentially killing themselves, and it's just really weird to see it. It happened yesterday during high tide. Some people actually tried to put them back in the water, but researcher Hannah Rosen says the deep water creatures swim right back to shore. They don't see the shore very often, so it might just be that they don't understand what's going on around them, and they're just trying to get away and don't realize that if they swim towards the shore, they're going to run out of water eventually. They're juveniles, both male and female, about a foot and a half long, weighing roughly three pounds. They had full stomachs, having feasted on smaller market squid. A few had also cannibalized each other, which is normal. To be honest, researchers have no idea why this is happening, but they think it's because the squid have eaten toxic algae. It's possible that the squid are ingesting either these neurotoxins or they're getting it through their food and that could be causing them to be disoriented and swim onto the beach. Homeboat squid haven't been in the Monterey Bay for a few years. Scientists believe El Nino weather patterns may have drawn them to the cooler waters of Northern California. This is the third stranding in six weeks. It's really an exploratory time for us so we're learning more about what causes these strandings and whether or not we should be worried about them or if it's just a natural part of the squid cycle. In Aptos, Kit Doe, CBS 5. Hi, I'm Arnie Gunderson. At Fairwinds, we get numerous questions about Fukushima and nuclear power in general. Someone on our team reads every one of them. This is the first in a series of short videos designed to answer those questions that come in from you, our supporters. I've been getting a bunch of emails about recently released NRC FOIA documents, Freedom of Information Act documents, about the condition of Fukushima Daiichi right after the accident back in 2011. It's clear from those FOIA documents that the NRC believed that a massive problem was occurring not just in the Unit 4 fuel pool, but likely in all of the other fuel pools as well. I think there's two points to be made. After the site began to be more under control, it appears that those were exaggerations by the NRC. And really, the fuel pools were not as bad as the initial documents led them to believe. So that's the good news. But the bad news is, let's look at how authorities responded. In the middle of March, they really believed that they had fuel pools that were in a catastrophic condition. And yet, what did authorities do? They did not evacuate. So I think the message here from these NRC FOIAs is, thank God it wasn't as bad as they imagined. But given what they knew in early March, why the heck did the NRC and the regulators in Japan issue a much wider evacuation? I think it's because they didn't want to frighten the public but yet they put the public at risk. It was easier to put the public at risk than it was to issue an evacuation and move more people out. Thanks for listening. I'm Arnie Gunderson, and I'll keep you informed. The hybrid offspring of domestic pigs and wild boars are increasing in number across parts of Fukushima Prefecture affected by the 2011 nuclear accident. 
These animals appear to be the offspring of wild boars and domestic pigs left behind by their owners. NHK surveyed 11 municipalities with evacuation zones due to the radioactive fallout from the crippled nuclear plant. Officials of five of those prefect or municipalities say the number of hybrid offspring appears to be on the rise. Tomioka town officials have reported 17 cases where hybrid pigs broke into houses and barns in search of food. I am so shocked by what the wild pigs are doing to us. Officials at the Environment Ministry say the animals give birth to larger litters than wild boars, around 10 piglets annually. Ministry officials and local hunters are culling the animals as they could interfere with residents returning to their homes.
Another year has come and gone, and your only notable accomplishment has been watching this internet news summary video. Miss Milky applauds your efforts.